Good afternoon. My name is Dustin DePew, and I'm the Director of Museum Collections at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Welcome to our new topic series, In the Armory, in which we will explore some of the historical weapons in our collection. Although the museum and library is back open with new guidelines and procedures, we have decided to keep our programming socially distant in an effort to keep our guests, staff, and constituents safe and healthy. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our members and donors for the support of the museum and library. We are proud to be a part of your history, military history exploration. In this segment, I will compare the Krag Jorgensen rifle and the Springfield M1903 rifle. The Krag Jorgensen has the unique distinction of being the first smokeless powder rifle adopted by the U.S. military. It went head to head with the Spanish Mauser during the Spanish-American War and came out with the reputation of being inferior to the German design and generally a poor combat rifle. This led to the United States developing the Springfield M1903 rifle, a copy of the Mauser design which served in World War I as our primary battle rifle. Today we will explore the differences in these rifles' designs, review their histories, particularly their use in two successive conflicts, and in the case of the Krag, we'll see what modern evaluations tell us about the validity of its poor military reputation. I'll start by spending a few minutes discussing what was happening in the world of firearms in the years leading up to the adoption of these rifles. This was a chaotic, fast-moving time in the evolution of firearms, ammunition, and the tactics for employing them. To put it in perspective, the world went from muzzle-loading cap-lock rifles to machine guns in just 25 years. We could spend hours talking about this period. Instead, I'll touch briefly on the major points I feel are necessary to understanding the context. For serious firearms history enthusiasts, I will be greatly simplifying the history. So if you want to discuss the finer points that I'll be glossing over or outright ignoring, I encourage you to do so in the comments section. In the decades following the Civil War, muzzle-loading long arms around the world were being replaced by breech-loading rifles using metallic cartridges that house the bullet, the black powder charge, and the ignition system all as a single unit, what we would call a round of ammunition. In the U.S. Army, the first standard issue breech loader was the Springfield Model 1873, the first in a family of trapdoor Springfields culminating in the Model 1888. These rifles were chambered for the 4570 cartridge, which in keeping with the limitations of black powder cartridges, fired a very heavy projectile at relatively low velocity. In this photo, you can see a comparison of a trapdoor rifle and an American Krag rifle. You may notice the difference in the thickness of the rounds of ammunition that are next to them. The 4570s being significantly heavier, about twice as heavy, uh, and moving quite a bit slower. The Napoleonic style of fighting, with its columns of soldiers firing in volley used throughout much of the 19th century, gave way to small unit tactics relying more on individual skills, particularly marksmanship. That proved successful for the United States during the American Indian Wars. The resulting marksmanship craze in the 1880s led to U.S. soldiers having arguably the highest level of individual marksmanship skill among major world armies of the world. While the U.S. Army focused on individual marksmanship and target shooting, it fell behind the curve on rifle development as many of the major powers began switching to magazine-fed bolt-action rifles that used the newly invented smokeless powder. Smokeless powder offered two obvious advantages. It created significantly less smoke when burned, eliminating the telltale plume of smoke that gave away one's firing position when shooting black powder. And it allowed for for rifle cartridges that were significantly more powerful than their black powder counterparts, and which flew in a much straighter trajectory, making it easier to achieve accurate fire at long distances. A third benefit was that smokeless powder cartridges could fire lighter weight bullets, allowing a soldier to carry more rounds of ammunition for this, the same amount of weight as they could with large caliber black powder ammunition. To address this, an ordnance board was convened in 1890 to test magazine systems for repeating rifles. 53 rifles were submitted for the test, including a Norwegian design called the Krag Jorgensen, and in 1892, despite being a foreign design and therefore a heavy underdog, the Krag was chosen as the winning design. The U.S. government was then immediately sued by several U.S. inventors whose designs failed to win the trials, forcing a second round of trials, which the Krag also won. 
Thus, it took a couple of years for American Krags to begin production. The Krag Jorgensen was designed by the Norwegian Ole Hermann Johannes Krag and Erik Jorgensen in 1886, and the first version of the rifle was adopted by Denmark in 1888. It was adopted several years later by, the, by both the United States and Norway, with all three designs having their own small design distinctions. After the 1890 through 92 ordnance trials, the U.S. paid a licensing fee to Krag and Jorgensen of $1 per rifle produced, and production began at the Springfield Armory in 1894. The American Krag, officially named Magazine Rifle, model of 1892, was produced as both a full-size rifle with a 32-inch barrel and as a carbine with a 22-inch barrel. There were improvements made to the design in 1896, 1898, and 1899. I'm not going to discuss these changes. However, if you're interested in the details, we have resources in the library that list the War Department records for all the changes made. In total, nearly 500,000 crags would be produced during its 10-year production run. The crag was in service with the regular army from 1894 until 1907 and saw combat in the Spanish-American War, the Philippine War, and the Boxer Rebellion. It was during the Spanish-American War that the Krag developed a reputation, warranted or not, as an inferior combat rifle to the Spanish Mauser and to the Mauser design in general. First, let's take a closer look at the examples from our collection. This is an 1898 model with the serial number 466458 which places its production date somewhere in 1903 and makes it one of the last 11,000 crags ever produced. Let's look at a few of the design features that make this rifle so interesting. The most unique aspect of this rifle is the magazine and the way it's loaded. You may notice this large piece of metal sticking out of the side of the receiver here and maybe wondering what that is. This is the loading gate that gives access to the magazine. Um, it, one difference that this rifle had from the original uh, Danish or, um, the original design is that it uh, has a, a hinge along the bottom so that it opens outward instead of opening sideways. I'm going to show that now. And it was the Danish model that this is, that this is different from. From this position, the magazine can be loaded with loose ammunition one round at a time and it can be done so with the bolt still being closed, which allows the rifle to still be in battery and fireable while reloading. Um, this was something that uh, the Ordnance Board, um, it was a requirement of the Ordnance Board to be able to do that. And it's really the, the main feature that uh, decided the selection in favor of the Krag. It's a cool feature for a bolt action rifle. Um, you know, the ability to reload while still being in battery and capable of fire still exists today with modern box magazine, magazine firearms. But if anything, in a bolt action rifle, it serves mostly to lengthen and complicate the reloading process. When considering the firepower of a small unit, it's more effective to simply fire one's rifle till it was empty and then re reload all of the rounds at once with a stripper clip. Uh, this is how most modern or most contemporary bolt action rifles of the time operated, including the Spanish Mauser. This was one of the major criticisms of the Krag that came out of the Spanish-American War. The Spanish, with their Mauser rifles, could put more rounds downrange than the Americans could with their Krags. A post-war review by the U.S. of the Battle of San Juan Hill, in which 750 Spanish defenders delayed the advance of thousands of American troops while causing 1,400 casualties, blamed the superior firepower of the Mauser rifles of course, American training emphasized slow, well-aimed shooting, while Spanish training emphasized rapid shooting. So doctrine may be as great a factor as design. Coupled with the terrain and defensive positions and the, dis the disparity of the rifles seems less and less a factor in the outcome. Another feature that the Army loved was the magazine cutoff, which allows for the bolt to be cycled without pulling around from the magazine. This replicates the single fire and single reload mechanics of the trapdoor Springfields that the Army was accustomed to. This was the Army's original plan for using the Krag with the extra four rounds in the magazine being for emergency use only. I'm gonna turn this over so you can see. The way that it works is there's a little lever here that you can flip into either the on or off position. 
I currently have it set in the cutoff on position. So one way that I can demonstrate how this is a, without having actual live rounds in it is if I operate the bolt on this uh, rifle here, you can notice that I can open and close it with no impediments. Now, if I turn off the magazine cutoff, what you're going to see is that the bolt's gonna catch. Of course, it's not gonna do it on camera live. Uh, it normally does catch this way. The spring that's pushing the magazine follower usually pushes it up just enough that it catches on the bolt as you're pushing forward. Um, it actually did that earlier today, so I don't know why it's not doing it now. But regardless, um, with that magazine cut off, turned off, every time you cycle the bolt, it's going to pull another around from the magazine and push it into the chamber. Speaking of the bolt, its design is responsible for one of the rifle's most notable positive features and one of its most negative. I'm talking about the single locking lug near the bolt face. I'm gonna pull this open again. Maybe hard to see, but right here, we've got a, a single lug. For anyone unfamiliar, the locking lugs help secure the bolt against the explosive force of the shell firing. If the back pressure is too high and the bolt fails, it could end with disastrous and deadly results for the person firing it. I referenced earlier that this was a great time of great change in firearms technology, and the bolt of the Krag is a great example of this. The single forward lug was perfectly capable of containing the explosive force of the cartridge it was chambered for, the 3040 Krag. However, it wasn't designed to handle the more powerful, higher pressure rounds that were already being introduced around that time. In other words, it just wasn't future-proofed. The Krag's nemesis, the Mauser, had two locking lugs near the bolt face a design that is so well suited to smokeless powder cartridges that it is still the dominant bolt design today. The positive effect of the single lug design is that the Krag is one of the smoothest bolt actions in existence and is regularly described as being butter smooth. Ultimately though, the negative aspect of this, this design choice was far more important to the longevity of the design as a military rifle than was the positive aspect. Although check any online forum of hunters talking about their sporterized crag rifles and you'll be inundated with butter smooth proclamations. Unfortunately, this particular rifle doesn't have a rear sight on it. So I'm gonna close the bolt here real quick. And you can see this is really quite smooth. Um, this particular model does not have a rear, rear sight on it. So I have a photo instead that will hopefully help showcase a little bit of what it looked like. And I will say that the Krag rifle had a total of five different rear sights in 10 years. I mentioned the marksmanship craze earlier. Well, the Army often couldn't decide what it preferred. Precise target sights suitable for competition on the range or durable combat sights that lacked precision but could survive the rigors of combat. This seesawing would continue with the M1903, which we'll look at in a few minutes. The Krag Jorgensen's service life with the regular Army ended in 1907 as the model M1903 became available. Crags continued to see use in the National Guard, the Army Reserves for stateside training during World War I, and in the case of some engineer units on French soil during World War I, though there's no evidence that they were ever fired in combat. Also, like many mass-produced rifles, military rifles, thousands went to the civilian market where most were sporterized and used as hunting or range rifles. Most modern examinations of the Krag, both scholarly and anecdotal, appear to exonerate it of the harsh assessment that came out of the Army following the Spanish-American War. It's a great historical rifle, as it existed during a critical evolutionary phase for military firearms and serves as an interesting time capsule that reveals, in part, the Army's small arms doctrine at the end of a century. That said, there is little doubt that the Mauser design is in fact superior. Considering that Mauser design rifles are still the most popular type of bolt action today is a testament to that. This brings us to the Springfield M1903. Named the United States rifle caliber 30-06 model 1903, it was adopted in, you guessed it, 1903. Like the Krag, it's a five shot magazine fed bolt action service rifle firing a 30 caliber bullet. In this case, the 30-06. It has a 24 inch barrel, an overall length of 43.2 inches and weighs 8.7 pounds unloaded. 
I didn't mention it earlier, but the Crag comes in a little over nine pounds unloaded. The development of the M1903 starts with the United States capturing thousands of Spanish Mauser Model 93 rifles during the Spanish-American War. As I mentioned earlier, the Army determined post-war that the Crag had been outclassed by the Mauser and wanted one of their own. It was studied at the Springfield Armory and the first prototype was produced in 1900. That was a bit of a, it was a bit of a Franken gun in that it used the stock, barrel, bands, and sights from the 1898 Crag with the receiver, magazine, and bolt mechanism of the Mauser. This was followed by a second and third prototype called the M1901 and M1902. And guess what years those were produced in? Each version added different features, some of which would be incorporated into the M1903. Following then current trends in service rifles, the barrel was shortened to 24 inches after it was discovered that a longer barrel offered no appreciable ballistic advantage, and the shorter barrel was lighter and easier to handle. This short rifle also eliminated the need of a shorter carbine for mounted troops or cavalry. A spike or ramrod bayonet that was stored in the fore end of the stock was added to the design. This new design was accepted and entered into production in 1903. Then Teddy Roosevelt saw the spike bayonet and said, no thank you, and it was altered to take a blade style bayonet. While changes were being made to accommodate Teddy's bayonet preferences, the US decided to update the round fired by the 1903. The original round was known as the 30-03 and was similar to the 3040 Crag in that it used a 220 grain round nose jacketed bullet. The difference being that the 30-03 fired 2,300 feet per second, which was about 300 feet per second faster than the Crag round. The updated round used the new pointed bullet shape known as a Spitzer, which offered ballistic, significant ballistic advantages over the round nose bullets that were in common use at the time. Um, they licensed the design used by Germany and, and for the Spitzer, and the 30-06 round was born. It fired a 150 grain bullet at 2,700 feet per second. The 30-06 round was slightly shorter than the 30-03, and to preserve accuracy, the entire existing stock of M1903s had to be rechambered for the 30-06, and the sights had to be recalibrated for the new, faster round. I have a photo here that shows the, two, the comparison of the 30-03 versus the 30-06. Um, I think one thing I, I might have misspoke a moment ago is the 30-03 you know, used the rounded nose bullet, and it was after the French and Germans started using Spitzer bullets that the US said, hey, we, we need to have one of these as well. So they decided to switch to the 30-06 round with the pointed Spitzer bullet. This 30-06 would go on to be used in the M1 Garand rifle that would, would replace the 1903 during World War II, and when, which was only slightly improved by the 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO round used in many of today's light machine guns, DMRs, and sniper rifles. In fact, the 30 out six is still one of the most popular hunting cartridges today. By the time of the U.S. entry into World War I, 843,239 of these rifles had been produced at Springfield Arm Armory and Rock Island Arsenal. Pre-war production utilized questionable metallurgy. Some receivers constructed of single heat-treated case-hardened steel were improperly subjected to excessive temperatures during the forging process. The carbon could be quote unquote, burnt out of the steel, producing a brittle receiver. Despite documented evidence indicating some early rifles were impro improperly forged, actual cases of failure were very rare, although several cases of serious injury from receiver failure were documented. The U.S. Army never reported any fatalities. Many of the failures were attributed to use of incorrect cartridges. Evidence also seems to suggest that improperly forged brass cartridge cases could have exacerbated receiver failure. Pyrometers were installed in December 1917 to accurately measure temperatures during the forging process. The change was made as the, at approximately serial number 800,000 for rifles made at Springfield Armory and at serial number 285,507 at Rock Island Arsenal. Lower serial numbers are known as low number 1903 rifles. Higher serial numbers are said to be double heat treated. The model we have here today is a low number Rock Island example.
With that said, let's take a closer look at the rifle we have here today and compare it to the Krag. First off, the, over, the shorter overall length of the rifle makes it handier than the full-size Krag. Couple that with the logistical and cost benefits of having a single-sized, standard-issue rifle, and we already see meaningful improvement over the Krag. You'll notice the sleeker look of the receiver, as there are no protruding loading gates for the magazine. The M1903 loads from the top. You simply open the bolt, like so, and insert the cartridges in, down into the magazine directly. Let's, uh, there we go. Right down into here, like this. Um, you can see here that there's a, there's a little, there's a metal follower, sort of similar to the Krag, but in a slightly different position, uh, that is under spring tension. And as you push rounds into there, the, the spring compresses, and then whenever you cycle the bolt, the spring pressure will push the next round up into, uh, uh, close enough to the bolt for it to be grabbed as the bolt is pressed forward, and the next round will be chambered. The preferred method of reloading is with a five round stripper clip. So although it can be loaded singly, you would really want to load it with, with the clip, which very quickly puts five rounds into the magazine. Um, in fact, you can see that there is a little notch here. I don't know how well you can see it or not, but this is the area where the, where the clip would actually be lined up with that, the cartridges would be pushed in, and the clip would be tossed away. This whole sort of setup here with the, uh, with the internal magazine directly below and the spring tension follower is the standard that you still see used in modern sporting rifles today. Although sporting rifles are typically loaded without a stripper clip, unless they're you know, an old surplus military rifle that's been sporterized. The M1903 does retain the magazine cutoff. I'm gonna turn this so you can see it. It's in a very similar position. Um, which I can demonstrate. I'm gonna try and demonstrate this again. We didn't work out so well with the Krag, but I currently have, let's see, let me start this over. Okay, the cutoff is now off. I'm sorry, the cutoff is on, so you can see it go through. Whereas with it on, there we go. We're hitting that magazine follower. And so now if we wanna close it, we have to press in a little bit. Obviously, if we had had a round in there, that would chamber the next round. Um, the, next, the next thing I'll talk about here is you've got your safety right up along the top. Actually, both, I didn't mention it with the Krag, but both of them have a very similar flag style safety that only, only operates when the um, firing pin is, is back and ready to fire. The next thing I'll talk about a little bit here is the sights, since we have sights on this model, we don't have sights on the, on the crag. And what we can see is that you've got a, a sight that can lift up, okay? And you've got a graduating, I'm not sure that you'll actually be able to see this that well, but we have, we have graduating, a graduating slide here that goes all the way up to what just says on here number 27, but that equals 2,700 yards. So this sighting system allows for a great deal of adjustment. You can fire it in this down position. This is considered the battle sight. And from this position, typically, this would be zeroed for about 570 yards, give or take a few. Um, which the idea being that you could point the, the, the rifle and aim the sights at an enemy's belt buckle, and you'd be able to hit them pretty much anywhere between point blank range and 570 yards. If one wanted to make uh, adjustments to zero the rifle at a lower, at a shorter range. One then does have to pull this up and adjust the slider down to a point that lines up with the with the with the 100 that's on here. Now, one other thing that you won't be able to see very easily here is there are one, two, three, four, five different rear sight either apertures or notches. So it's quite a complicated sight. There's a lot going on here. Um, I, you know, from what I understand, a lot of times soldiers would use the, there's a little aperture in here. An aperture sight is, you know, m most of you will probably know what that is, but for anyone who doesn't, it is um, a little pinhole essentially that, that you look through and you line up with the front sight um, and it allows for um, extreme precision. Um, now, <laughs> one interesting thing about this, this and pretty much all the rifles from this time period, they have very optimistic sighting systems. 
uh, in that it's very unlikely that anyone would ever make a hit uh, even close to 2,700 yards. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It kind of goes back to um, you know, what we were saying earlier about this mix of 19th century practice and early 20th century advancements. Um, the only way to really use a rifle like this at the outer distances that are, that are listed on here would be if a large number of soldiers were to fire and volley and hope that some of their rounds found the target. As you can see, when I shoulder the weapon, if I'm actually trying to line up the sights, the rear and front sight, I'm now shooting way high up in the air to compensate for the uh, drop of the, of the round. There is tremendous bullet drop at distances outside of 600 yards. Um, in fact, a 30-06, mo even a modern 30-06 round, which is shooting a little bit faster than the rounds were at the time that this was around, um, drops four, at least 400 inches at 1,000 yards. So you can imagine how much more it drops at 2,700. Interesting little mix of new ideas and old ideas with this. Um, one thing I sort of skipped over here that I do want to talk about, though, is the bolt face. So this will be quick. We mentioned that the one of the main problems with the Krag, and basically the reason it was replaced, is that it only had the single locking lug in the front. Well, with this Mauser design, Springfield, you have, and you're not going to be able to see it very well, but you have a, a lug on either side, essentially, of the front of the bolt. And you also have this third sort of safety backup lug that locks right in in the front here. And between the three of those, um, this is as solid as a rock. And it's such a good design and so strong that it's continued to be used to this day for all manner of, of you know, high powered 30 caliber and above uh, rifle rounds. Um, so this is, was truly future proofed and um, you know, Mauser was ahead of his time with his designs. Prior to World War I, the Springfield 1903 reigned supreme on many of the rifle ranges of the day. Amazingly, the, o the 03 in military configuration successfully competed against the best target rifles from other nations in the 1912 Olympics and other prestigious shooting matches. So it's also including to being a durable firearm with a, you know, a, an incredibly strong design, it's also quite accurate. There are many accounts of the effectiveness of the M1903 during, the war during World War I. One was related in John Harley's The Marine for Manatee, quote, even in the matter of defeating machine gun nests, two U.S. Army general staff officers who had been in the thick of the fighting reported the value of accurate rifle fire. They said that in some cases, American riflemen had been able to get on one or more flanks or to the rear of machine gun nests at some distance and had been able to fire their Springfields with such accuracy that the machine gunners were often shot through the head or vital part of the body." End quote. Finally, we can't talk about the M1903 during World War I without mentioning the M1917 Enfield rifle. Previous production of the M1903 couldn't meet the new wartime demand as America entered World War I. At the time, several American manufacturers, including the Springfield Armory, had been building Enfield P-14 rifles for the British. And rather than retool the facility for the M1903, the U.S. simply licensed the design of the Enfield and built what was known as the M1917 Enfield. It is a fine rifle in its own right, and there were even more M1917s in service than M1903s. We happen to have an M1917 in wonderful condition here at the PMML, but the story of that rifle will have to wait for another day. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this program and are looking for more engaging content, be sure to visit our website for a list of free videos on a host of thought-provoking topics. If you're not a member of the museum and library already, please consider becoming one today. Our membership community is vital to supporting activities that help fulfill our mission and vision. Thank you for joining us.